When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, good evening. As you know, last weekend, um, Megan Morey spoke. I thought she did a fabulous job about Pentecost, about the surprise and the shock and the stirring of Pentecost. Um, she shared a wonderful image about the Nevada landscape and the stars being so bright. And I don't mean Las Vegas. I mean the star stars. Um, and I thought, you know, we really have a lot to learn about the Holy Spirit. In our Gospel of John text, Jesus says that he has so much more to tell us. It spurred me to read this little book by J.B. Phillips. It says, it's, your God is too small for me. This book explores the many ways that we limit God's awesome power and grace by our small thinking. Is God the resident policeman? Mr. Meek and Mild? The grand old man? Why do we want to put God in a box? There are many people who have turned away from churches in general, saying, those Christians are so judgmental. The church is more concerned about beautiful buildings and rituals than faith being real. Those proper people are more concerned about who can get in rather than including everyone in the kingdom. There's a real search for something authentic, isn't there? A real experience with God, not just trite verses. God is revealed in so many ways, and as we look at Father's Day tomorrow, we give thanks and we're reminded of the many fathers and parent figures in our lives. Good fathers and mothers love unconditionally. The good news is that our Heavenly Father also loves us so much that he reaches out with grace and he gave us his son Jesus, who also taught us to love unconditionally, to welcome a stranger, to eat with tax collectors and prostitutes. I can't recall Jesus ever saying, love everyone except, ever, do you? His love was inclusive and he challenges us to be his disciples. But we're so busy. Even retired people are so busy. How can I really be a disciple? I mean, I'm not leaving my fishing nets, selling everything I have, giving it to the poor, am I? How are you called to be a disciple? Well, we certainly live in a community where there are many kids who need love. There are people that are guardians at Lightham. There are kids who need a lunch. We think about the backpacks that we pack. Some kids need help with homework or help with a service project. Parents can be overwhelmed and there may be a lack of family support and values. Is God calling you to help Rachel with Sunday Seeds? Can you make a difference to our teen students? Can you teach or share a skill with Habitat for Humanity? There are people who are lonely. Is Meals on Wheels an opportunity for you? We all have neighbors we don't really know, let alone care about them, right? So how can you be an asset in our community? When I hear Romans 5, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, I have to admit my mind wanders, and I rationalize I'm so busy, and then I realize I've coughed up. But we have confidence and peace through Jesus. We can walk in grace and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But then Paul goes on to say that we rejoice in our suffering. Well, that's not usually my response, rejoicing in the suffering. Well, you all know my wonderful husband, Jeff. He's a storyteller. We met, he was telling stories, and he loves people so much, and especially kids. We met doing youth work many, many years ago, and he still tells stories to the high school youth when Sunday school is in session. He encouraged me to tell you my story. I'm so grateful for his love for me, for our family, 
and for our community. Um, and he's right, we all have a story. In um, many other churches, they talk about personal testimonies, PTs. A lot of us are very uncomfortable about that. But here's mine. My dad could talk with anybody, and he always managed to hear their story. I had a very happy childhood, very loving parents, a strong community, three other siblings. I went on to college. I enjoyed the learning. And then tragedy struck. I had a brother with severe addictions, which broke our heart. And then my family was involved in a terrible car accident. My 47-year-old father was gravely injured, and I was the oldest. He was in a coma for 10 months. He died just after I married Jeff. We were shaken to our core. And I'm not happy about that pain, but we were surrounded by a community of faith. My dad's last sermon was on Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we had been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us strip off every weight and let us rid ourselves of the sin which so persistently surrounds us. Let's run with steadfast endurance the course that is marked out for us. As we do, let's keep our gaze fixed on Jesus, who in order to win the joy that was set before him, steadfastly endured the cross, thinking nothing of its shame, and has now taken his seat at the right hand of God. Well, at the time, I remember feeling very weak, not sure that I had the strength to even have faith. Boy, I was needing some of that Holy Spirit strength. I remember being comforted by Luther's explanation of the third article of the Creed from my confirmation days. It's funny how these things come back to you when you need it. And it says, I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or even come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. In like manner, as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. And as always, this is most certainly true, right? Several years later, my mother was in a terrible car accident, and she died. My family was shaken again. In those times, I was not strong enough. My family and I were being carried by this church. He helped me plan a funeral. He brought food to my family, helped us with housing. And several women took many, many walks with me around Crane's Roost to help me move through that grief. Even though things would never be the same again, it doesn't mean that life can't be good. Even out of the pain of childbirth comes the joy of a Sarah, a Nathan, or an Olivia. Suffering does produce opportunities for us to grow even that we don't want it. We become empathetic for others. We learn about addiction programs to help others. We learn to walk slowly again. When Beethoven learned that he was going deaf, I mean, every musician's nightmare, right? Going deaf. He said militantly he would take life by the throat. He kept going. He kept composing. And we're all blessed by his gifts of music. Some Bible translations of this Romans passage say that suffering produces perseverance. Others says endurance, some fortitude. And this is that spirit you all know. It's that spirit that can overcome the world. Not just sit passively back and be victims, but actively overcome any trial or tribulation. We come out of it stronger, purer, and nearer to God. Just this morning, our neighbor shared with Jeff about her journey with brain cancer and an aneurysm and how it changed her. Our wonderful friend Dennis, heart valve replacements, kidney cancer, seizures, and he will persevere in rehab. 
Everyone I know who has suffered a great illness or suffering comes out changed. We can rediscover there is still so much joy in so many relationships. Great leaders, whether leaders in our families or positions of corporate or political power, don't whine. They inspire us to persevere, to get creative, to work through whatever that difficulty is, whether it's a war, a family problem, a divorce, an illness, a lost job. It's work and it's exhausting, but we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. One of the gifts of a healthy church community is generosity. It's generosity of our time to build up children, to build up trust, to teach, to give our treasure so that various ministries can even happen. It may be scary to come out of our comfort zone to really make a difference a ministry like I Dignity or Coalition for the Homeless. It may be scary to tithe. I mean, we are talking money. That's scary. Our youth on mission trips say their serving has been a life-changing experience. But it is what we're called to be and to do. It feels good to give, and it feels good to be Jesus' hands and feet. We are called to be community cheering on our kids to do their very best. Think about it like you're in a stadium and the kids are running around. Go, you can do it. Jeff used to tease me that I knew every kid on the team. <laughs> Nobody needed a program. <laughs> and we're, we're praying for those and encouraging those who are ill. We're sitting with the grieving and we reach out to make strangers our new friends. Doesn't the practice of church make it all easier? This perseverance, endurance, or fortitude then becomes a habit. And then it becomes your character. We have scripture to help us remember these things. You may have heard the phrase, the phrase, baptism by fire. Well, it's usually when you walk into a situation that seems impossible. A work situation, a, a customer who's never gonna be happy, it might be a family situation that seems impossible. Um, and being tested provides an opportunity for us to grow and remember our baptism. I'd like you to take your red hymnal in your book and in, in front of you, and I'd like you to turn to page 236. And this includes you, Olivia. And I'd like you to read sort of right up here. Um, the words of this affirmation of baptism and our baptism service are the same. And I'm like, one of the things about liturgy is it's our work together. And I think one of the benefits of reading together is it's not somebody doing it after, but we're doing it together. So, God made this covenant with you in holy baptism. Read it with me. To live among God's faithful people. To hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. To, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ, Christ through word and deed. To, to serve all people following the example of Jesus. And to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Those are some pretty powerful words. And when you think about our confirmands, when they are being confirmed, they are affirming their baptism. And so we bless her with, Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in her the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith, guide her life, empower her in her serving, give her patience in suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. This is what it means to be church. We do baptism, we're fed with the word at Holy Communion, and we love. It's not just ritual but reminders to walk in grace. So we need the Holy Spirit to blow his power into and through us authentically. Character then produces that hope, and hope doesn't disappoint us. Jesus says that he has so much more to say to us. So let's listen. <laughs> 